And if you got your Bible, I want you to turn to Galatians chapter 1 and welcome Siena and Cyprus and downtown and those digital family as well. We're so glad we're all connected throughout our city and here at the Loop campus as well, which is great, man. We are kicking off things big time here, getting ready for school to start, all those sort of things, a couple things to let you know. Uh, maybe your schedule, you're going to be traveling on Sunday mornings or getting away or you just want to sleep late. We've got an incredible five o'clock service you can come to as well, which would be great. Uh, uh, and then 9.15 as well as our 11 o'clock just grows and grows, which is wonderful. So many great services, so many great campuses that we have, um, which is just amazing. We've been learning about Paul this week and last week as well. And here's the reason, is I want to get you ready for Romans. When we jump into Romans in a couple weeks, I want you to know this guy, Paul, that's writing it. And what we're going to see today is we're going to see Paul in the desert now, you know Paul is an evangelist. You know Paul is a, a, a mover and shaker. They like to say this, that wherever Paul goes, it's either a revival or a riot. That's what takes place with Paul. But I want us to see him differently today in a way that you maybe have not thought of him, of Paul in the desert. And we're going to see that in Galatians chapter 1, beginning in just a moment in verse 13. Have you ever been to the desert? Have you ever gone to the desert place? Have you been to the desert? Well, my wife and I and our kids, we decided that we were going to go on a family vacation. And so we headed to Big Bend National Park. It was amazing. We got in the car and we drove and we drove and we drove and then we spent the night and then we drove and then we drove and then we drove until we finally ended up at this little visitor center that we could pay whatever it was so we could go into the park. So we're in our car, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law in their car behind us with all the cousins. It's going to be great. Little did we know that once we got to the visitor center to get to anything to really see, we were going to drive and we were going to drive and we were going to drive. And so we were so excited to be there. We had come down I-10. We had been flying down I-10, keeping reasonable about the speed limit. We had dropped down. It was about 65 to get there, keeping it reasonable about the speed limit. I pay my money. Nobody tells me that the speed limit goes from 65 here to 45 here across this federal line. So we roll down the windows because we are finally excited to be there. We're excited to be there. And we literally have a song cranked up and everybody is pumping their fist out the window. Is dad's going about 70 or 65? Until I see a park ranger who all of a sudden as I'm singing and smiling, woo, the lights start going. I had not made it a quarter of a mile into Big Ben. I had driven for 40 years to get there. <laughs> and a quarter of a mile in, which goes by fast at 65 or 70, I'm now pulled over to the side as my brother-in-law is laughing behind me. And so we pull over, I keep the windows down. This always works so that the police can see how cute my kids are in the back seat. And then I finally was like, y'all cry, somebody cry, somebody just cry. Not a, not a boo-hoo, just a, just a, he's a good dad kind of cry. So I get out of the ticket, which is great. I get a warning as if the federal government doesn't have enough of my money, I need a ticket from them now. And so I get a warning, which is great. And so we continue on in the desert. You got to slow down when you get to the desert. You got to slow down. Why? Because you'll destroy things by going too fast and you'll also not see things by going too fast. Let me show you just a couple pictures of the desert so you'll get the, the picture of where we are in Big Ben. But do you know in Big Ben, there's things that you can't see that are all around. There's 1,200 different kinds of plants. There's 11 different kinds of amphibians. There's 56 different kinds of reptiles, 40 different kinds of fish, 75 different kinds of mammals, 400 different kinds of birds. And only in Texas, and only it feels like it would be Houston, 3,600 different types of insects, right? That's what's happening. There's things you can't see in the desert. There's beautiful things actually in the desert, isn't there? When you slow down enough to look, and we're going to see Paul in three years of desert. Now to get there, I'm gonna recap where we were last week. So the first few verses I read, if you were here last week, you're gonna go, I remember that message. And then we're gonna jump in and see Paul in the desert. Here we go. There's great things that happen in the desert. 
Chapter one of Galatians, verse 13, for you have heard about my former way of life in Judaism. This is, he was named Saul at this point. I intensely persecuted the church and tried to destroy it. He approved people being killed. Verse 14, I advanced in Judaism far beyond my many contemporaries among my people because I was extremely zealous for the traditions of my ancestors. So he's ambitious in climbing the career out ladder, leaned against the wrong wall. Verse 15, but when God, three big words for us last week. I want us to say those three words together. All campuses, digital family as well. One, two, three. But when God, one more time. But when God, when you're in a place of chaos, God shows up and you'll say, but when God gave me peace. When you're in a time of desert, when God shows up, you'll say, but when God met my thirsty needs. When you're in a time when you don't know what's going to happen, but when God shows up, he makes a way where there is no way. But when God, from whom my mother's womb, from my mother's womb, set me apart. We talked about last week, all throughout the scriptures is the mother's womb, the sanctity of life and the sovereignty of God. God had a plan from his mother's womb. But when God, who from my mother's womb, set me apart and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I could preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone. That was all last week's message. I did not go up to Jerusalem to those who had become apostles before me. Instead, I went to Arabia and came back to Damascus, verse 18. Then after three years, I did not go up to Jerusalem to get to know Cephas, which is Peter, and, but I stayed with him 15 days. Let's just stop right there. Did you see the but when in Arabia, the end of verse 13? I went to Arabia. The desert is a place of preparation. The desert is a place of preparation. Now think about the Bible with the desert. There's so many places in the Bible. Moses for 40 years is tending his father-in-law's sheep to prepare him for the 10 commandments and leading the people out. David is anointed king over Israel as a teenager, but he didn't come to the throne till he was 30 because God wanted to prepare him to be the king. Joseph spent two years in prisons of Egypt before he would lead to prepare him. Elijah, the faithful prophet, was hidden by a brook and fed by ravens for God preparing him and taking him further. John the Baptist, years of solitude, silence, and obscurity, so he could finally declare, this is the Lamb of God. Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days. Jesus in Gethsemane for the time before the cross. Even if you were to look into Luke chapter 3, verse 2, I love this. The word of the Lord came to John in the desert. The desert is a place of preparation. It's painful. It's long but God's doing something to use you and to speak to you in a greater way, in a greater way. So what could a desert be for us? Deserts can be times of grief, times of hurt, times of heartache, times of hard times. Deserts can be times of waiting, times of transition. Maybe you're transitioning from one job to another. Maybe you just moved to Houston. You're like, I, why? I, I want to be back there. Maybe you're transitioning from middle school to high school or high school to college or into the workforce, whatever it is. Times of transitions can feel like deserts. Times of boredom can feel like deserts. And this was a little weird, but follow me. Deserts can be times where we've gotten so accustomed to God's blessings that we're walking in a desert because we just want another firework show. We've already had 50 firework show. But where's the next one, God? And we begin to be in that place of a desert. Paul is in a desert for three years. The disciples were with Jesus for three years. Now Paul is gonna be with Jesus for three years. And I want us to get this because when we get to Romans, I don't want you to think Paul just sat down one sunny afternoon and wrote it. This huge, great theological document of Romans that we're going to get to is Paul sitting in the desert, studying the Torah, studying the Jewish scriptures, scratching his head, saying, I'm a scholar in Judaism, and Jesus just knocked me off my horse on the road to Damascus. What is this? Is the Messiah shown in the Old Testament? Is Jesus the Messiah? And for three years, he spends time with the Lord. Listen to just a couple quotes. Chuck Swindoll, 
Our perspective on waiting is perhaps one of the strongest ways our society is out of stride with the biblical world view. For three years, Saul lived somewhere in the desert, cut off from his former manner of life in solitude, quietness, and obscurity. You do the math and you'll come up with over 1,000 days unaccounted for in Saul's life. A thousand plus days, most likely he spent alone, all alone, thinking, praying, wrestling within, listening to the Lord. Listen to this. If he'd ever been addicted to popularity, he lost the urge to pursue it in those wilderness years. If one, at one time he had become enamored with his own spiritual significance, that self-inflated pride melted away in the warmth of God's presence. A thousand plus days, Paul is in the desert. Why? Because God's bringing him lower and lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. Do you remember in Acts chapter nine, he was on the high horse on the way to Damascus. He gets knocked off his horse and he gets lower and lower and lower and lower. Do you know what the name Paul means? It means small. God took Saul on a high horse and made him small. And when you and I get in the desert, we get our face prostrate before the Lord and we start saying, God, would the pain stop, Lord? Lord, would you help me? God, would you call me away from this place? God, would you fix this? Lord, I'll pay anything. I'll give anything. I'll do anything. God, I'm so parched. I'm so dry. There's so much that's just made me smaller and smaller. And I don't know if I'm going to make it another day, God. And God says in that moment, I've got things in the desert I'm going to show you. I've got all different species, if you will. So that when you raise up, you're going to raise up strong in me, not strong in you. Here's the phrase, heavenly success depends on downward significance. Heavenly success depends upon downward significance. It means God making you smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, then he can use you greatly until God makes a man nothing, he can create nothing from him. Now, let me quickly say, that does not negate ambition. Be ambitious, students. Be tremendously ambitious. Let it be a go for it thing. Make the best grades you can. Get the best job you can. Do whatever you can do. Make it in the most ambitious you can have. But watch this. Don't let your success be built on the back of your insecurity and your woundedness. Watch. Let your ambition and success be built on the firm foundation of your identity in Christ. And many of us, our ambition is because we got wounded somewhere along the way. And we're trying to prove it to everybody that we're worth more than we think we're worth. And instead, you find your worth in Jesus Christ and you stand on that rock solid foundation. And from that, you be the greatest whatever there is to be. But you do that from security, not from insecurity. So Paul goes to a place where he's got to get his security in Jesus Christ and him alone. And then from that place, he's going to be the greatest Christian that ever lived. He's going to write 13 out of the 27 books of the, Old, of the New Testament. And when we get into Romans, we're going to know it came from a thousand plus days of him in the desert. And we're going to flip those pages and go, thank you, Paul, for spending that time. Heavenly success depends on downward significance when we get low and small before the Lord. Think about when you get to heaven, how small will we be in heaven? Standing before the throne of God on streets of gold, having gotten there through the grace of Jesus Christ. Anybody going to say, well, I got a degree from such and such. <laughs> I'm somebody, not here. You're not somebody. We already got our somebody. He's on the throne. Small, small. His name means small. Now, let me show you a verse of scripture of how this fits in. Acts chapter nine gives a whole lot about Saul turning to Paul. And this, we're gonna get a little technical, so Bible people, get ready, here we go. Acts chapter nine, verse 22 and 23. If you were to just read it today, you'd go, oh, okay, because most versions say, and after many days, he did this. That phrase, many days, is actually three years, Okay. So you could write in your Bible and by Acts chapter nine, we're gonna put it on the screen in just a second, between verse 22 and 23 is three years and that's Galatians chapter one. 
Here's what it says in the Amplified Bible. The Amplified Bible is not just louder, it's telling us a little bit more, okay? We used to, as teenagers, we'd walk into Christian bookstores and we'd open up the Amplified Bible and go, I found the Amplified Bible! It's funny when you're 12, but, uh, you know... <laughs> Here's what it says in verse 22, chapter 9 of the Amplified Bible. We'll put it on the screen. But Saul increased in strength more and more. Now, interesting. That word strength is the same word used in Hebrews to describe Samson with physical strength, supernatural physical strength, but it's used here to talk about Saul, Paul, in spiritual strength. Saul increased in supernatural strength more and more and continued to perplex the Jews who lived in Damascus by examining theological evidence. He's doing his homework and proving with scripture that this Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and the anointed. Verse 23, after a considerable time had passed, about three years or so, that's what we're talking about, the Jews plotted to kill him and then it goes on from there. So this three years is really significant. Now, let me give you four things that happen in the desert. And then I'm going to give you three things to do in the desert. Four things that happen in the desert. Let's look first at verse uh, 17. One more time to get our framework. I did not go up to Jerusalem to those who had become apostles before me. I went instead to Arabia, that's the desert, and came back to Damascus. Then after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem and on it goes from there. So Paul is trying to prove that he's an apostle. He's saying, look, I got this from God. I didn't go, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? Instead, he said, I got this from the Lord. So I'm an apostle. Y'all need to listen to me and believe what I'm saying. And so Paul here is going to get, he's going to go to the desert for three years. Here's the phrase I want you to get. The where of the desert recalibrates the why of our purpose. The where of the desert recalibrates the why of our purpose. Do you feel like you have purpose in your life? God may take you through a desert to refine and recalibrate your purpose. Maybe heartache, hard times, maybe grief, maybe transition, maybe just waiting, maybe you got blessings upon blessings upon blessings and you don't know what to do with them all. God's done more than you could ask or imagine and you're not sure, you're kind of confused a bit now. First thing that we learn in the desert is this, the desert pushes me from self to service, from self to service. Paul was climbing the ladder of Judaism. He was a Pharisee of great respect. And it says that he was accomplishing far beyond his contemporaries. I showed you that in verse 14, advancing in Judaism far beyond my contemporaries among my people because I was extremely zealous for the faith. So he's doing it. He's making it happen. But at some point you go through the desert and you go, I can't buy my way out of this desert. I can't trophy my way out of this desert. I need God to do something in me and to change me from self to service. And now Paul is going to actually become an evangelist of the gospel and he's going to have life-threatening issues that are going to happen. People are going to come after him. He's going to have to be snuck out of town in a basket through a wall. He's going to have people that are going to come after him. He's going to be shipwrecked. He's going to be bitten by a snake. He's going to be beaten. All these things are going to happen. Why would you do that? You would do that because you say, this is not real life. This serving the Lord really is. So the desert changes us from selfishness to service. Number two, the desert cultivates trust in God's power, not in mine. When we read in Acts chapter 9, verse 22, it says Paul was strengthened with a supernatural strength, like the Samson of the heart, trusting in God's strength, not mine. Now, guys in particular, and ladies for sure as well, but guys in particular, let me talk to y'all. We want to fix it, don't we, really quick. What went wrong? How can I fix it? Who do I need to call? How much money do I need to spend? What do we need to sell, buy, get, consult, hire? How do we need to do this? We're going to fix this problem and we're going to get an airlift out of the desert or at least getting water pumped in. But how do we fix this? And at some moment, you finally on your knees go, Lord, I can't fix this. And I've got to trust in your power. I've done everything I can. We went through a challenge in our family and didn't have anything to do with church, didn't have to do with any health. It was just a challenge we had gone through. And there was some some papers that kind of symbolized that challenge. I have a prayer kneeler in my bedroom. And I literally, I sat the papers on the prayer kneeler kind of shelf. I sat them there and they stayed there for a year. 
I said, God, I'm asking for 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. I'm laying it before you because I've done everything I can do to try to fix this and you got to show up. And let me tell you, I'm standing here and he did immeasurably more than I could ask or imagine. I couldn't dream of the way he provided. It's a blessing upon a blessing and it was a burden upon a burden. You and I have to learn to trust in God's power. This is one of my favorite verses, Colossians 1, verse 29. For this, I labor and struggle with all of his energy that works so powerfully within me. Laboring and struggling with all of God's energy that works so powerfully within me. Colossians chapter one, verse 29. Number three, the desert calms our hearts and increases our faith. The desert calms our hearts. At some point when you're going through a time of of heartache, when you're going through a time of transition and you finally say, Lord, I can't do it. It's you, I surrender to you. And you sit down, then the peace that passes all understanding can hit your heart and he can calm your heart. And you're gonna make it through. You're not making it, made it, you hadn't made it through yet, but you're gonna make it through. And that sand of the desert becomes a comforting place where your heart can be calm. My wife and I, we were walking around, we had gone to eat, and so we started walking down to this little kind of boutique store, which, husbands, you know what this means. I could see the store coming, I could see her li- eyes lighting up, and I was thinking, this is, this is costing me money. Just walking in the door, there's an entrance fee. We'll walk out with some type of prize, but just walking in. Because guys, we like to walk into efficiency, right? We want big aisles with huge things, and you know, forklifts, beep, 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 backing up in our stores, those sort of things. Things that are very efficient, we can come in, and we want tan, we want blue, we want white, We walk out, we go, and that's it. But ladies, y'all like an experience that happens there. It doesn't really matter what's in the store. It's how the store is presented. And so I'm like, what a great marketer, this beautiful store. So we walk into this little store, and and there we are. And all of a sudden, this beautiful smell hits us. And we can see this candle that's been burning for days upon days upon days. And my wife walks in, and the young man walks up and says, how am I help you? She says, what is that wonderful scent? And I'm like, I'm pulling out my credit card. And he says, oh, that's that candle there. And she said, what is that scent? He said, with, with like a straight face, it's warm sand. <laughs> and I'm thinking, warm sand is not a scent. Blueberry is a scent. <laughs> Strawberry is a scent, right? I always think they need to be a, there need to be a candle that's bacon. You know, that's a scent. You just smell it and just it could crackle in there somewhere, you know? Warm sand is not a scent. I, I, I said, we could, let's take some sand and we'll put it in the, into the, like the microwave. And let's crank it up. Let's... Smells the same as wet sand or dry sand or cold sand or room temperature sand. Oh, but no, warm sand. We left with a candle of warm sand from that place. And it's great. When people walk into our house, they're like, that smells great. And I'm like, oh gosh, you too? (laughs) Warm sand. But I tell you what, you put that warm sand candle on, I got to admit, I know my wife's happy because she got it. I think the guy changed the price tag when he saw her face light up, but that's okay. <laughs> and there it is. And you got a cup of coffee and you got your Bible in your lap. The desert becomes a place of calming your heart. If you're in a desert, slow down, calm down. Don't wait till the doctor tells you you got six months to live before you take account of the blessings in your life. You slow down and you spend time with God. Number four, the desert makes us quiet. Quit talking and start listening. The desert makes us quiet. Quit talking and start listening. You know what's coming, don't you? School's gonna start. And we're going to go crazy. Oh, so busy, so busy, so busy. Oh, there's this and this and the kids got this and school's this and all that. And even if you don't have kids, there's there's a rhythm of all of our lives. It's kind of based on those semesters. And it's going to get crazy, crazy, crazy busy. And then we're going to finally get to October and the weather's going to change. Oh, doesn't this feel good? Thanksgiving's coming up. 
Oh, we got to get things ready. Where are we going to go? We're going to grandma's, we're going to grandpa's. For kids of divorce, holidays are an annual dilemma. Where are you going to go? Who are you going to please? And it's going to churn up, churn up, churn up, churn up, churn up. And then finally, we're going to get over Thanksgiving and say, man, I was awesome. Did you see that game? Did you eat that turkey? I took a big nap. That was great. Christmas, it's on the doorstep. I don't have my shopping done. There's no parking places at the mall. I'm too busy. We've got all this stuff trying to wrap up the last ends of school. Busy, 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 busy. And then Christmas will be over. We'll go, oh, wasn't that great? Boy, I'm worn out. New Year's. (laughs) And then it all starts over again. And right now, we have a moment called Houston Hot August. We don't leave our house from 11 to 3 every day. Be quiet and listen. There's plenty of warm sand around here. (laughs) And quit talking and start listening and get into this thing called the Bible and walk with God. You know that Bill Gates, of all the things he's invented and all the intellect he has, he has every year what he calls think weeks. He takes a bag of books and he goes off to a little cabin in the Northwest and he sits and he reads for a week. Every year he picks a subject and he just reads everything he can possibly read on that subject and he has a think week. Paul had a think three years. So when we get to Romans, that's written years after Galatians, He's been thinking about this. And you and I need some think week as well to really process these things. We're gonna wrap up fast. Let me give you three action points if you're in a desert. I told you what God would do in the recalibration with four things in the desert. Give you three action points if you are in a desert. Look, if you will, into the scripture. And it says in verse 21, Afterward, I went to the region of Syria and Cilicia. That's actually Paul's home providence. I remain personally unknown to the Judean churches that are there, that are in Christ. And they simply kept hearing, he who formerly preached, or he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith he once tried to destroy. Saul to Paul. Verse 24, here's our life goal of every person in the room. And they glorified God because of me. They glorify God because of me. Number one, we're hitting it fast. Here we go. Keep the faith. If you're in the desert, keep the faith and keep walking. Water is coming. Keep the faith and keep walking. Water is coming. We were in Big Ben. We drove and drove and drove from the entrance and we got to this place called the Santa Elena Canyon. It's right here behind me. 1,500 feet Up in the air are these cliffs. The Rio Grande comes through. In the middle of this desert, you end up with the most beautiful water source. Let me show you a couple pictures. In the desert, keep walking, keep the faith. Water is coming. Beautiful, beautiful water. Even this last picture of me just there in the desert there with this beautiful, beautiful canyon. You keep walking, there is water that is going to happen. You stay small, you stay on your knees, you stay with God, you keep quiet and listen to him, and you keep walking. Water's coming, the canyon's gonna be there. Number two, drink the living water of Jesus. Drink the living water of Jesus. What an amazing thing to drink the water of Jesus. Jesus. John chapter 4, Jesus says, if you drink of this water, you'll thirst again. But if you drink of the water I give you, it'll be like a bubbling brook coming out of you and you'll never thirst again. John chapter 7, Jesus stands up at the feast of the last day, big important day, and declares, if anyone's thirsty, come to me. Jeremiah, Jeremiah says that you have broken cisterns that cannot hold water, but come to me and have your thirst quenched. Let God quench your thirst in Jesus. And then number three, realize God uses the desert to blossom fields of his glory. Realize that God uses the desert to blossom fields of his glory. It still may hurt for the rest of your life. You still may not ever get back what you lost. Still may be a wound and a limp like Jacob on the hip. But God can use you and make your misery into your ministry to somebody else. Listen to verse 24, and then we're going to end, and we're going to take the Lord's Supper. And they glorified God because of me. Underline that in your Bible. 
That's our life's goal. So as parents, what do you want your kids to do? What do you want their lives to be? Well, I hope they make a million dollars. That's great. I hope they make a million dollars too. I hope they're really happy. That's awesome. I hope they're really happy. I hope they're super successful. I think that's great. I hope they marry well. Amen and amen. But the main thing is that our parental hope as believers in Christ is that they would glorify God because of us. See it? You can have a million dollars and not glorify God. You can have uh, all sorts of fun and happiness and not glorify God. But the parental hope is that they would glorify God because of me. That's what Paul says, that in your workplace, they'd glorify God because of you. In, in, your, in your family, they'd glorify God because of you. In your apartment, in your condo, in your house, in your townhome, they would glorify God because of you. My hope is pastor, sure, we got a lot of programs. We want to expand. We want to do stuff. We got kinos. We're building stuff. I hope through something I said at some point, you glorify God because of me. That's my hope. We can have all sorts of bells and whistles. If we don't glorify God as the people of God, what are we doing? And Paul says at the end of this whole thing, I've been through three years of desert. People are trying to kill me. I've been Saul. I've been Paul. I've seen Jesus face to face. And I just hope, hope, I hope, I hope that they glorify God because of me. And my friend, that only happens through the cross of Jesus Christ. Doesn't happen through your willpower. Doesn't happen through your spiritual power. It happens because Jesus Christ died on the cross. Don't miss this. Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood for you and became the savior of the world. Do you see the significance, the downward significance? He is the king of kings and Lord of lords. He traded the riches of heaven for the poverty of earth and he began to walk these sinful paths of dust. He began to walk with sandals on his, on his feet that he would wash other people's feet. He didn't have a place to lay his head. They stole his clothes. He was naked on the cross. He was beaten on his back. He was stabbed in the side. He was given a crown of thorns. They robed him in purple to mock him and they nailed him with military precision to the cross. And he was laid in a borrowed tomb. How much smaller can you get? And yet on the third day, because of that downward significance, his heavenly success, he rose again and he is the savior of the world. The world. and is alive today. And even in his humility, people use his name as a cuss word and still live. Jesus. So my friend, watch, here we go. With that, we're gonna take a step and take the Lord's Supper. Do you see the difference? When you hold that little piece of bread, little bitty, signifies his body slain for you. And that thimble of juice is his blood slain for you. And he got so downwardly significant, he was mocked and beaten and killed because he loved you and me. So we don't come to the Lord's Supper. Oh, good, it's time to go. Yeah, we need, I'm getting hungry too. We come going Wow, you will see me through your desert or through my desert because you walked through your own desert and I trust you and I'm nothing and you're everything and I'm nothing and you're everything and I just hope that somehow Someone will glorify God because of me. And I give it to you, God. That's how we come to the Lord's Supper. I'm going to pray. We're going to prepare the elements. If you don't have them during my prayer in the section in front of you, there's elements you can get. You can walk down in the time that I'm praying. That's a OK. Father, we come 
as small as we possibly can. We ask you, Jesus, that you would be as big as we possibly could see you. Oh, Lord, there's some deep, hot deserts. They're painful, hurtful, incomprehensible, and we don't understand them. And sometimes we're mad, and sometimes we're sad. Most of the time, we're just broken. So we come to the cross in the blood of Jesus. Thank you for Paul for a thousand plus days thinking, praying, and seeking you. So we come to the Lord's Supper, Lord. We want God to connect with you in the symbolism of the body and the bread and the blood and the juice of your desert that yielded beautiful fruit of the resurrection. Take a moment, if you will, just just a second and reflect before we go to the elements. Thank you, Jesus. In your name, amen. If you'll take your Lord's Supper cup, and if you'll prepare the bread side, just open that up. Take the piece of bread in your hand. Matthew chapter 26. And this is for believers in Christ. If you're not a believer in Jesus, then let this be an example to you of the gospel. Verse 26, as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body, the body of Christ broken for you. Now, if you're prepared, the juice side. Verse 27, Matthew chapter 26. Then he took a cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of this vine, from now until the day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And after singing a hymn, they went to the Mount of Olives, the blood of Christ shed for you. Father, we're grateful for your downward significance that led to such heavenly success. And we pray, God, that you would just prepare us Prepare our hearts. Help us to walk through these hot, hard times. But to see as an example the fruit of the life of Paul, we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for watching. To find out more about Houston's First, you can subscribe to our channel or you can go to houstonsfirst.org.